from 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 through 8, and 17 through 19. And it was that when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, after being dismissed by the Philistine ruler, the Amalekites raided the Negev and Ziklag. They smote Ziklag and burned it with fire. And they took captive the women who were in it from young to old. They did not kill any, rather they led them away and went their way. So when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned and their wives and daughters and sons taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until there was no more strength in them to weep. Now the two wives of David had been taken captive, Ahinoam the Jezreelite and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. David was in great distress, for the people said to stone him, because the souls of all the people were embittered on account of their daughters and sons. And David strengthened himself in the Holy One, his God. Then David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring to me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David, and David questioned the Holy One of old, say, asking, Shall I pursue this band? Will I overtake them? God answered him, Pursue, for you surely shall overtake, and you shall surely rescue. So David smote them from the twilight until the evening of the morrow. None of them escaped except 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. And David rescued all who the Amalekites took. David rescued his two wives. None was missing, whether young or old, daughters or sons, spoil or anything they took for themselves. David brought back everything. And from Matthew. Chapter 18, verses 10 through 14, which verse 11 is missing because it's not in all of the manuscripts, just FYI. Jesus said, see to it that you do not treat one of these little ones with contempt. I say to you all that their angels in the heavens see the face of my Abba, who is in the heavens all day, every day. What do you all think? If a person has 100 sheep and one of them wandered off, If they find it truly, I tell you that they rejoiced over it more than over the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, it is not the will of your Abba who is in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. Please pray with me. Holy One, we seek you out for answers to our questions. We don't always see that our questions can come too late. Open our eyes to the ways that we have not lived with compassion and kindness until we experience the unkindness of others. Show us how to redeem our mistakes without punishing others. We know that you are faithful, God. We know that you want good for us. Help us to perceive lives that make all lives better, not only our own. Help us to see our connections to one another instead of all that divides us or creates disagreement. Show us that all of us are siblings of one another and of Christ. Help us, to sh- help us to rejoice in the joys of others and weep in their sorrow. Help us to know your love in all circumstances. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dr. Gaffney writes that her lectionary selections today each have some concern for children, not just literal children, not just young humans, but those and those who are most vulnerable, but also those who may be adults, but still the children of others. Daughters and sons, the next generations, generations, whether or not they are literal descendants of a particular family, carry the stories and experiences and lives of a people into the future. Each generation of a nation, of a church, of a people in relationship with one another and God depends upon those who come after to carry on beyond the limitations of human lives. It doesn't always mean in exactly the same way as the ones who came before. 
It might even be some great change happens. But those stories and those experiences are carried forward, hopefully changing for the better. From the consequences of David's life and choices on the lives of those closest to him, to the ways in which children and those new to the faith are welcomed or not, multiple generations of people experience the effects of the decisions and the actions that are made before they are born. Those of us here were born into a nation that we like to celebrate, and yet we also can know that it was built by slave labor in great part. Most of our ancestors settled on land where indigenous nations were already living. They were forced out by military force and by the ways in which land was acquired without their consent. Our lives are what they are today. And those descendants of those indigenous people are what they are because of what our ancestors have done in the past. And the children, both grown and still not born, that come after us will also bear the burdens of decisions, whether wise or foolish, that we have made. Whether or not we have children of our own, our choices and actions have consequences for many generations. There can't be much better example of a biblical story with far-reaching consequences than that of David. In some ways, there was good that came out of, the, of how he ruled. In some ways, as Dr. Gaffney has pointed out, his reign was as violent and as brutal as any other. And his descendants continued to experience that legacy beyond his life and for many generations. As we read farther into the stories of David's journey to the throne of Israel, we read that he had been fired by the Philistine ruler, which we kind of got that idea from the text I talked about last week because he wasn't doing exactly what the guy wanted him to do. And he continued his raids of conquest. In the meantime, those that they raided were also raiding back and forth. In this case, the Amalekites raided the city where David and his followers had been. Maybe it was their home base. And it seems that they had left their wives, including David's present set of wives, Ahinoam and Abigail. The text says all the women of all ages and sons, which probably are the male children who were not in the army already, were taken. And when they came back and discovered this, they wept loudly until they were all exhausted. And his people, his followers, you understand, those who believed in him, at least partly, were about to stone him because they blamed him for this raid. And it's probably true. It was probably, it was probably a tit-for-tat kind of thing. They were coming back at David for what he had done. So it says that he went to God and spent time with the Holy One. And then he asked the priest to bring him the ephod. One of those biblical things, those words. The ephod was a priestly garment worn over regular garments. And you may have seen pictures or seen um, or uh, descriptions of it. It had a breastplate with 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And it also had pockets and things that carried things like the, what, we, what are called the Urim and the Thummim, which are the divination tools. We might think of them as dice, but they were probably more like sticks. And they were used to ask God yes or no questions. Should I do this? And you roll the bones and find out. When David asked if he should pursue those who had taken the people and the spoils, God through these tools, said yes. God said yes. I'm guessing not that there was a real question about what David had to do for David to live to be king. The people were going to stone him, after all. He had to do something. The people were about to stone him for the consequences of his actions, whether they were the result of his raiding or simply because he wasn't present in Ziklag when the Amalekites came. His actions had led to the situation. 
and it was up to him to do something about it. The next generation were relying on him. His own children, the children of those who supported him, and all of the children of those who were there when the, when the raid had happened. In the midst of the story, whatever had happened in the past and whatever he would do in the future depended on this moment. What was David going to do? As Dr. Yafni writes, the psalmist, which we used as our call to worship, provides a prayer fitting for the moment, fitting for the people whose wives and children were taken into captivity at the thought of their fate. Enslavement, physical and sexual abuse, and the fate of themselves. It's fitting for David as he faces the loss of his family and his own death. How long, O Lord, will you forget us forever? How long will my enemy be exalted or be victorious over me? As is often said today, the struggle is real in this text. It is life and death here. It is life and death when people face enemies that are destructive. It is life and death when the people who are to love you or love those in their family and care for them, reject them, or treat them with contempt, contempt or ridicule or disgust. Which leads us into the New Testament reading in the Gospel lesson. Jesus warns about how people are to be treated in community. He talks about the little ones. The little ones treated with contempt. And those little ones may refer to actual minor children and or those who are new to the faith. In this short parable like saying, Jesus asks about the sheep that wander off. And because of how he leads into it, we can tell that he's referring to the little ones being treated with contempt and leaving or being tempted away. The angels of those little ones, it says, rejoice when they are found, when they are celebrated, when they are embraced and taken into the flock or the community. To me, Jesus implies that the one who wandered off was treated with contempt or ignored or disposed of instead of being sought and found, instead of being embraced and treated like they belonged. The one who wanders away carries with them the memory of why they left. The ones who are carried away as the captives in the David story also carry memories and the fear of being taken from where they belonged. Each is vulnerable to abuse and suffering without those who love them. Each needs that loving kindness, that belonging and the community that can be offered. The little ones that Jesus wants to protect show that people can be vulnerable to abuse or suffering or contempt or disgust wherever they are, even in the place where they should belong. Yet it is only with a loving community that they can be protected and experience self-worth and value. If we are concerned at all about this world being a better place for coming generations, then I hope that we can give them permission to look to the past with honesty and with the willingness to prepare the damage that our ancestors and that we have done. Like David, at times it might take a straight rescue because of the result of past decisions. But I hope that we can allow them to look with truthful discernment at the actions of this generation and see that more could have been done. We could have done more to repair the damage done by the forced labor of people who were enslaved. We could have done more to repay the theft of land and culture and resources from indigenous people, even if we could not repay the lives that were lost. We could have done more, and we should welcome the actions of those who will do more as time goes by, even if it means criticism of ourselves. So let us welcome the questions that are asked. Let us give hope instead of discouragement to new generations. Let us open our eyes and our hearts to what the future holds. 
and rejoiced when the lost are found. To the glory of the Holy One, the Faithful One, the Womb of Life. Amen.